This is a reading from the Virgin Mary in the writings of Maria Valtorta by Father Gabriel M. Roshini. Five Marian Portraits. Before presenting a synthesis of Valtorta's Mariology, it seems appropriate to sketch an overview of Mary's remarkable personality as it emerges from Maria Valtorta's Il Poema del Uomo Dio. Let us contemplate five Marian portraits and admire the many sunbeams which emanate from this transcendent being. Reading through Il Poema del Uomo Dio, we discover five truly evocative scenes which depict Mary's normal traits, Mary's moral traits, and give her true theological ascetic portrait. The first four portraits were drawn by her divine son, the supreme artist, the fifth one by a young Jewish prophetess named Sabia of Carmel. One, the first portrait, this is my mother. In the third year of his public ministry, in his small, humble home in Nazareth, Jesus speaks about his mother to the apostles, the shepherds, and the women disciples, and other people, approximately 40 people in all. He draws her moral portrait. I wanted you to be here so I could tell you about Mary. Many of you know Mary as the mother, some as the spouse, but no one knows her as the Virgin Mary. I want you to become acquainted with her in this garden in bloom behind her house in Nazareth, to which your hearts desire to come when you are compelled to be far away, as to a resting place after your apostolate work. I listened to you apostles, disciples, and relatives speak, and I heard your impressions, your recollections, and your statements concerning my mother. I will transfigure all that which is admirable, although still very human, into a supernatural knowledge, because my mother is to be transfigured before me in the eyes of the most deserving, to show her as she is. You see a woman, a woman different from other women because of her holiness, but in actual fact, you see her as a soul enveloped in a body just like all women, her sisters. But I, but I now wish, but now I wish to reveal to you the soul of my mother, her true and eternal beauty. Poema 5, 268-269 After saying that, Jesus turns towards his mother. Come here, mother, do not blush, do not withdraw shyly. Sweet dove of God, your son is the word of God, and he can speak of you and of your mystery, of your mysteries, O sublime mystery of God. Let us sit down here in the pleasant shade of the trees and blossom, near the house, near your holy room. Thus, let us lift this fluttering curtain so that waves of holiness and paradise may come out of this virginal room to saturate us all with your virtues. Yes, me as well, that I may be perfumed with you, O perfect virgin, so that I may be able to bear the stench of the world in order that I may see purity after saturating my eyes with your purity. Marzium, John, Stephen, come here, and you, women disciples, Stand directly in front of the open door of the chaste abode of the most chaste amongst women. And you, my friends, stand behind. And you, my beloved mother, here beside me. A little while ago I said to you the eternal beauty of the soul of my mother. I am the word, and thus I make use of words without erring. I said eternal, not immortal. And I deliberately said so. He is immortal who, after being born, does not die. Thus the souls of the just are immortal in heaven. The souls of sinners are immortal in hell, because a soul, once it has been created, does not die but to grace. But a soul has life. It exists from that moment that God thinks it. Thus it exists in God's thought. It is the thought of God that creates it. It is therefore eternal in God's thought, in its beauty, in which God poured every perfection to receive delight and comfort from it. It is written in the book of our ancestor Solomon, who foresaw you, Mary, and can thus be called your prophet. God possessed me from the beginning of his works, from the very beginning, before creation. From everlasting I was firmly set. From the beginning, before the earth came into being. Proverbs chapter 8, verses 22 to 31. Yes, mother, with whom God, immense, sublime, virgin, uncreated, was pregnant and carried you like a most sweet burden, rejoicing at feeling you stir within him. Then, with your smiles, he created the universe. He laboriously gave birth to you to give you to the world, 
most gentle soul, born of the Supreme Virgin, to be the Virgin. Footnote 25. He laboriously gave birth to you to give you to the world, most gentle soul, born of the Supreme Virgin, to be the Virgin, was changed as follows in D2. With immense love, God poured you out into a flesh to give you to the world, most gentle soul, created by the Supreme Virgin to be the virginal soul of the Virgin. The perfection of creation, the light of paradise, the advice of God, who looking at you forgave sin, because you alone, by yourself, can love as all mankind put together cannot love. In you is the forgiveness of God. In you is God's medicine, O caress of the Eternal One's wound, that man inflicted on God. In you is the health of the world, O Mother of the Love Incarnate, and of the granted Redeemer. O soul of my mother, merged in love with my father, I looked at you within me, O soul of my mother, and your splendor, your prayer, the idea of being carried by you, comforted me forever and ever, for my destiny of sorrow and inhuman experience of what corrupted the world is for the most perfect God. Thank you, Mother. When I came from heaven, I was already full of your consolation. I descended, perceiving you alone, your perfume, your song, your, your love, joy, my joy. Now that you know that only one is the woman in whom there is no stain, that one only human being costs the Redeemer no injury, listen to the second transfiguration of Mary, the elect daughter of God. It was a clear afternoon in the month of Adar, and the trees were in bloom in the silent kitchen garden, and Mary, Joseph's bride, had picked a flowery branch to replace the one that was in her room. Mary, taken from the temple to adorn a house of saints, had recently come to Nazareth, and with her soul divided among temple, house, and heaven, she was looking at the flowery branch, considering that by means of a similar branch, branch which had bloomed in an unusual manner, God had revealed his will to her. It was a branch cut off in this garden in the depth of winter, and it had bloomed as if it were springtime before the ark of the Lord. Perhaps God, beaming in his glory, had warmed it as the sun. And she was thinking also that on the day of their wedding, Joseph had brought her other flowers, but never like the first one on the thin petals of which it was written, I want you united to Joseph. She was thinking of many things, and while thinking, she ascended to God. Her hands were busy with distaff and spindle, and were spinning a yarn that was thinner than the hair of a young head. Her soul was weaving a carpet of love, moving quickly like a shuttle on a loom from the earth to heaven, from the needs of the house of Joseph to those of the soul of God. And she sang and prayed, and the carpet was forming on the mystical loom. It rolled off from the earth to heaven. It ascended to get lost up there. Formed with what? With the thin, perfectly strong thread of her virtues, with the flying thread of the shuttle, which she thought was hers, whereas it was God's, the shuttle of the will of God, on which was rolled the will of the little, great virgin of Israel, unknown to the world, known to God rolled and made one with the will of the Lord, and the carpet was adorned with the flowers of love, of purity, with palms of peace and palms of glory, with sweet-smelling violets, with jasmines. Every virtue flowed on the carpet of love, which the Virgin of God unrolled invitingly from the earth to heaven. And as the carpet was not sufficient, she thrust her heart, singing, Let my beloved come into this garden, and eat the fruit of his trees. Let my beloved come down to his garden, to the bed of spices, to pasture in the gardens and gather lilies. I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He pastures among the lilies. Canticle chapter 5, verse 1, chapter 6, verse 1, 2, and 2 to 3. And from infinite distance, among torrents of light, a voice came that human ear cannot hear, and human throat cannot utter. And it said, how beautiful you are, my love, how beautiful you are. Your lips distill wild honey. You are a garden enclosed, a sealed fountain. My sister, my promised bride. Canticle chapter 4, verse 1 and 11 to 12. And the two voices joined together to sing the eternal truth. Love is stronger than death. Nothing can quench or drown our love. Canticle chapter 8, verses 6 to 7. And the virgin was thus transfigured when Gabriel descended 
and called her back to the earth with his ardor and joined her spirit to her body again so that she might hear and understand the request of him who had called her sister but wanted her to be his bride. So the mystery took place there, and a modest woman, the most modest of all women, who was not even aware of the instinct of the instinctive incentive of the flesh, was dazed before the angel of God, because even an angel accepts the humility and modesty of the virgin, and only when she heard him speak she calmed down, and she believed, and she said the word, thereby, whereby their love became flesh, and will defeat death, and no flood will be able to quench it, or wickedness to submerge it. Jesus bends gently over Mary, who has slid to his feet almost ecstatically in the recollection of the remote hour, shining with a special light which seems to issue from her soul, and he asks her in a low voice, Which was your reply, most pure mother, to him who assured you that by becoming mother of God you would not lose your perfect virginity? And Mary, almost in a dream, slowly, smiling, her eyes shining with joyful tears, I am the handmaid of the Lord, let it be done to me according to your word. And she reclines her head on the knees of her son, adoring him. Jesus covers her with his mantle, concealing her from everybody's eyes, and he says, And it was done. All will be done until the end. Until her next transfiguration, and the one after that, she will always be the handmaid of God. She will always act according to what the word says. My mother, that is my mother, and you ought to begin to become fully acquainted with her holy figure. Mother, mother, raise your face, my beloved. Call your devout admirers back to the earth, where we are for the time being, he says, uncovering Mary after a little while, during which no noise was heard except the humming of bees and the gurgling of the little fountain. Mary raises her face, wet with tears, and whispers, Why did you do that to me, son? The secrets of the king are sacred. But the king can reveal them whenever he wishes. Mother, I did it so that the words of the prophet may be understood. A woman will enclose the man in herself. Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 21 to 22. And the words of the other prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And also that my disciples who are struck with horror at too many things that they consider degrading for the word of God may have as counterbalance many other things confirming them in the joy of being mine. Thus they will no longer be scandalized and will conquer heaven. Poema 5, 268-273 In this marvelous presentation of His Most Holy Mother, Jesus is speaking about four Marian transfigurations, the four fundamental brushstrokes in this portrait. portrait. In the first transfiguration, Mary is shown to us as she exists in all of eternity, in God's mind and heart, before existing in reality. The second transfiguration takes place at the Annunciation, when God, the incarnate Word, began to exist in her. In the third, barely sketched transfiguration, Mary is on Calvary, where she becomes co-redemptrix, the mother of sufferings. With the fourth, with the fourth at last, her glorious assumption in body and soul is faintly suggested. That was the first portrait, really divine and worthy of the supreme artist. The second portrait. How do you see Mary? The second Marian portrait, like the first, was painted in Nazareth during the third year of Jesus' public ministry. This is the context. Judas Thaddeus, Jesus' cousin and Mary's nephew, turns towards the divine master and asks him point blank, Brother, tell me, I've been waiting, I've been wanting to know something for a long time. How do you see Mary? As mother or as subject? She's your mother, but she is a woman, and you are God. Jesus answers, I see her as a sister and a spouse, as God's delightful rest and as man's comfort. In Mary, I, as God and as man, see everything and have everything. She was the delight of the second person of the Trinity in heaven, the delight of the word of the Father and of the Spirit, and she is the delight of the incarnate God, and will be the delight of glorified man. What a mystery, the zealot says, musing. Twice God deprived himself of what delighted him. You, then Mary, and he gave you both to the earth. What great love! You mean, 
James says, Love is what prompted the Trinity to give Jesus and Mary to the earth. Thomas asks, But weren't you afraid, not for your sake since you are God, but for your Rose's sake, to entrust her to men that are all unworthy of, un of protecting her? Thomas, Jesus replies, The Canticle of Canticles, chapter 8, verse 11 to 12, will answer you. The peaceful one had a vineyard and entrusted it to overseers, but they were desecrators, prompted as they were by the desecrator. They would have paid large amounts of money to own it. In other words, they would have tried to, to seduce it by all means. But the Lord's beautiful vineyard looked after herself by herself. She wanted to yield her fruits to no one but the Lord. She wanted to open to no one but Him, thus begetting the priceless treasure, the Savior. Poema 6, page 946. This second portrait also is simple and delightful. The Blessed Virgin is the delight of the Most Holy Trinity, the joy and consolation of the Incarnate Word, the God-Man, the well-guarded vineyard which yielded all its fruit to the Lord alone, and who gave birth to the priceless treasure, the Savior, and the delight of the glorified God-Man. 3. The Third Portrait, The Golden Ark Jesus sketched another portrait of his mother not very long after the first, in a discourse he made in the synagogue in Capernaum about the living bread which came down from heaven. John chapter 6, verse 41. His audience was scandalized at his words and began to murmur. Jesus replied, Why are you grumbling among yourselves? Yes, I am the son of Mary of Nazareth, the daughter of Joachim of the house of David, a virgin consecrated in the temple, and then married to Joseph of Jacob, of the house of David. Many of you have known the just parents of Joseph, a royal carpenter, and those of Mary, the virgin, heiress of the royal stock. And you thus say, How can he say that he descended from heaven? And you become doubtful. I remind you of the prophets who prophesied the incarnation of the word. And I remind you that it is a dogma, more for us Israelites than for any other people, that he, whose name we dare not mention, God, could not become flesh according to the laws of mankind, and then impoverish mankind at that. The most pure, uncreated one, if he humiliated himself by becoming man for the sake of man, could but choose the womb of a virgin, purer than lilies, to clothe his divinity with flesh. The bread that descended from heaven in the days of Moses was placed in the gold ark, which supported the mercy seat, and was watched over by the cherubim, behind the veils of the tabernacle. And the word of God, the tables of the law, was with the bread, the manna, and it was right that it should be so, because the deepest respect is to be paid to the gifts of God and to the tables of His most holy word. So what will God have prepared for His own word and for the true bread that has come down from heaven, a more immaculate and precious ark than the gold one to support the precious mercy seat of His pure will to immolate Himself, watched over by the cherubim of God, veiled by virginal purity, by perfect humility, sublime charity, and all the most holy virtues. So, do you not understand yet that my paternity is in heaven, and that consequently I come from there? Poema 5, pages 325 to 326. Here we have a synthesis of the three fundamentals of Mariology. Mary's unique mission, to be the mother of the Word, the Word made flesh, the living bread, come down from heaven for the salvation of humanity, to Mary's remarkable privileges, she is the virginal ark, more precious than the one which contained the manna and the tables of the law. 3. The exceptional veneration due to this ark. The three portraits so far, painted with so much filial love by, the, by Christ's hand, complement one another and blend into one full of heavenly light. The fourth portrait, the solitary flower of Nazareth. We can find another portrait of the Blessed Virgin by Jesus when he addressed himself to Simon the Zealot in the first year of his public ministry. There is a flower in Nazareth. There is a flower that lives solitary, fragrant with purity and love for her God and her Son. That is my mother. You will meet her, Simon, and then you will be able to tell me whether there is a creature like her, also in human grace, on the earth. She is beautiful. But everything is surpassed by what emanates internally from her. If a brute should divest her of all her clothes, should disfigure her and send her roving, she would still appear as a queen in royal dress, because her holiness would cover her 
as a mantle and confer splendor on her. The world can give me all possible evil, but I will forgive the world everything, because to come into the world and redeem it, I had her, the humble and great queen of the world, the queen whom the, queen whom the world does not know, but through whom it had received good and will receive still more throughout centuries. I solemnly tell you that the true house of God, the holy ark, is her heart, the veil of which is her most pure flesh, and its embroidery work are all her virtues. Poema 2, page 293. This little portrait highlights several of Mary's qualities. She is unique and transcends all other creatures. There is no creature like her. Mary was incomparably beautiful, but more importantly, she glowed with inner beauty. Her majestic royalty made her a queen, surrounded with holiness. Her supremely beneficial work was to give the supreme good, the Savior, to the world. Mary's final trait found in this portrait was her generous, saving influence throughout the, through the centuries. She is the house of God, the holy ark, decorated with every virtue. The fifth portrait, the perfect handmaid of the Lord. This portrait is drawn by a 30-year-old Jewish prophetess of the tribe of Aaron, Sabia of Carmel of Beth Lecky. This takes place during the third year of Christ's public ministry at Zacchaeus' farm near Jericho. A young woman, inspired by God, has just made with a shrill voice and luminous eyes the highest praise of Christ, the Redeemer, the Messiah. She is now making a transition to talk about his mother. She says, Behold your king, O people of God. Get to know his face. God's beauty is standing before you. God's wisdom is in front of you. God's wisdom has taken a mouth to teach you. O people of Israel, it is no longer prophets who tell you about the unnameable one. He himself, who knows his own mystery, is telling you about God. He knows God's thoughts. He is taking you to his breast, a people who are still children after so many centuries, to feed you with the milk of God's wisdom, to turn you into an adult in God. To do this, he has taken flesh in a womb. Yes, in the womb of a woman of Israel. In God's and men's eyes, she is the first among all men, among all women. She has ravished, ravished God's heart with a single one of her dove's coos. Canticle of Canticles, chapter 4, verse 1 through 9. The beauty of her spirit has charmed the Most High, and he has turned her into his throne. Miriam, the sister of Aaron, sinned, because sin was found in her. Numbers 12. Deborah was discerned. Deborah discerned what had to be done. Deborah discerned what had to be done, but she did not do it herself. Judges chapters 4 and 5. Jehiel was strong, but she stained herself with blood. Judges 4, chapters 17 to 23, and chapter 5, verses 24 to 27. Judith was, was, Judith was a just woman and feared the Lord. God was in her words, and he allowed her to act so as to save Israel. But out of love for the fatherland, she had crafty recourse to murder. Judith, chapter 8 to 16. But the woman who gave birth to God is above all those women, because she is God's handmaid, and she serves him without sinning. She is completely pure, innocent, and beautiful. She is God's lovely star from the time she rises to the time she sets. She is wholly beautiful and pure, and shines through and through so as to be both star and moon. She is the light that helps men find the Lord. Unlike Miriam, Aaron's sister, she does not walk in front of the holy ark or follow it, because she herself is the ark. She runs over the face of the earth and saves people from the stormy flood of sins that covers the earth. For whoever enters the ark finds the Lord. She is a spotless dove who takes wing and brings back to men the olive bough of peace. Genesis chapter 8, verses 6 to 12. Because she is the fair olive tree. Ecclesiasticus chapter 24, verse 14. Though she remains quiet, her silence says more and achieves more than Deborah, Jehel, Judges chapter 4 and 5, and Judith, Judith chapter 8 to 16. She does not suggest warfare. She does not urge massacres. She spills no blood but her own, which is much more noble, with which she made her son. Poor mother, sublime mother. Though Judith greatly respected the Lord, a man took her as one picks a choice bloom. Judith chapter 8 verse 2. But the inviolable bloom blossom gave herself to the Most High, and God's fire descended into the cup of that sweet lily. Thus, a woman's womb has contained and borne God's power, 
wisdom, and love. Glory to this woman. Sing, O you women of Israel. Sing her praises. The young woman stops as if her voice was worn out. Actually, I wonder how she could speak so loud for so long. The scribes say, she's crazy. She's crazy. Jesus, tell her to be quiet. She's crazy or possessed. Order the spirit that got a hold of her to go away. I cannot. That is none other than God's spirit, and God does not drive himself away. You won't do it because she's praising you and your mother, and that flatters your pride. Scribe, think about what you know of me, and you will see that I am not a proud man. Yet, only a demon could talk through her to speak so highly of a woman. Another scribe says, Women, what are women in Israel? What does woman mean for Israel? It can only mean sin in God's eyes. She was seduced, and she seduced Adam. If it wasn't for the faith, it would be hard to imagine that women have, women have souls. Women aren't even allowed to go near the holy because of their impurity. And this woman says that God could have, would have come down into a woman? The scribe is scandalized, and his peers approve what he says. Jesus, as though speaking to himself, begins to speak without looking at anyone. He says, The woman shall crush the serpent's head. Genesis 3.15 A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be called Emmanuel. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, do we? And there shall come forth a rod out of the root of Jesse, and a flower shall rise up out of this root, out of his root. And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 2. Due. That woman is my mother, scribe. For the sake of your knowledge, remember the words of the book and understand them. The scribes do not know what to say. They must have read those words a thousand times, acknowledging their truth. Could they deny it now? They remain silent. Poema 7, pages 1700 to 1702. Footnote 26. The poema contains this other short portrait of Mary. She had the countenance of an angel, eyes like stars, and a smile sweeter than the kiss of a mother, as sweet as her name, which is Mary, so holy as to be able to bend over the newborn God. Poema 4, page 764. This final portrait depicts the Virgin as God's perfect handmaid, with her dazzling, eternal purity of body and soul, she serves God in both the incarnation of the Son of God and the redemption of humanity. That is why she is worthy of praise and glory. Jesus, with various scriptural prophecies, confirms against the scribes themselves the very high praise of his most holy mother by the young prophetess.